and the guys for that great conversation. Hopefully, we will continue in that same vein and share some additional thoughts. We're coming to you live from the Cal Bank head office here at Ridge Number 23 Independent Avenue. And the Cal Bank head office is one of the only green buildings here in Accra today, even if we say so ourselves. And we're privileged to be part of this conversation. I'm just getting straight to it. All over the world in different fora, in different conversations, in all the boardrooms and all the meetings, you hear the talk of digitization and even more so brought on by the onset of COVID. Everything in our lives is changing today, but today we want to bring the conversation home to a specific aspect of our conversation, which is in the built environment, if you like. In May of 20, um, in 2019, there was a research carried out by four students of the University of Science and Technology. And here's what they had to say, that about 40% of the global energy is used by buildings here in the world and here in Ghana as well. Today, we'll be having this conversation on seven main topical areas, and we'll be joined by some of the finest brains in this conversation. I'll be introducing them shortly, or better still, I'll let them introduce themselves. But here are the areas of the conversation that we're going to be having just for those who like to take notes as well. We're looking at smart buildings and automation for efficiency. If you're in the built environment, you're looking to invest in that field as well. We will be spending some time and sharing some thoughts on smart buildings and automation for efficiency. We'll also be sharing some thoughts on the regulatory impact of smart buildings, the fire codes, the building codes, or the regulatories in each country, the ordinances, and how they affect the entire process. We'll also be looking at one of the key things in all of this conversation, which is the performance matrix performance matrices. How do we leverage on all of these innovations to help to bring efficiency to our process, our cost management, our resource utilization? And then we go on to artificial intelligence, AI, and augmented reality. How we leverage on all of that to also help to make this entire process better. Then we go on to using digitization to achieve efficiency in our planning and forecast. Data is big today. Data helps to make decisions, trend analysis. If you go back and look at the things that have happened in the utilization of your building and its management and how you've used the resources, then you're able to make better decisions and forecast, even for the purpose of budget for your CAPEX and for your OPEX as well. So again, we'll be looking at some of those thoughts um, as well. I will be going straight to my uh, resource persons for today. I'm joined by four fine gentlemen. Two are with me here in the studio and two are outside and joining me virtually. So um, perhaps I'll start with the gentleman in the studio. To my extreme left, I'll let him introduce himself and then we'll go in that order. And then we'll join the gentlemen who are also joining us virtually. So um, Reginald, do you want to okay, start? Okay, sure. Yes. So my name is Reginald Obey. I'm currently the head of property management at Denton Property uh, Managers which is a subsidiary of Gold Key Properties. Um, I've been in this space for the past 15 years, and so <laughs> I'm happy to be here to give a little insight on, on, on these topics. Great. I mean, he, he does say little insight, but I've been interacting <laughs> with these gentlemen for the, uh, the past three days, and trust me, there's nothing little about the information that they're going to be sharing here today. Obed, do you want, do you want to take over? Right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. My name is Obed Ampedwe Siyama. Uh, I'm the head of property and facilities management for Fidelity Bank Ghana Limited. Um, I've been in this space as well for about 22 years and here to share a few thoughts uh, with you all. Thank you. I like the way they say few thoughts. 22 years. <laughs> few thoughts. <laughs> 22 years. Few thoughts. Paul is smiling very, very widely. Paul, talk to us. <laughs> So, yes. oh, sorry. Hi, so, so uh, I'm Paul Shudi. I'm the CEO founder of uh, Unified, which is a approaching the whole way of facilities management in a very different way. So I've been involved in this for eight years now, developing new technologies, new communication protocols, uh, before, uh, a data analysis company, which we grew to 14 countries. So I got to really, you know, we really pushed the limit of data and how we affected um, our, our clients around the world. and. What I've done now is taken data and hardware and communication protocols and pulled them together for a for really smart building technology. Um, what we hope is a very simple way to deliver the impact um, that's needed globally right now. Thankfully, you didn't say very few or very little. You didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be tough to us. Don't be very few, I don't like it. Sleep. I don't get much of that. <laughs> well, so uh, my name is Kofi, Kofi Asari, and um a doctoral student at the ME Rinka School of Construction Management here at the University of Florida. Um, so my research interests um, lie in the areas of building information modeling and facilities management, also life cycle analysis, um, sustainability, 
But in the last few years or in the past two years, I've mainly focused on integrating building information modeling with facility management. And as part of that, um, I have been working with a major Southeastern US international airport um, on one of their capital improvement projects, which involves addition of a new terminal and in trying to integrate building information modeling with facility management for them. So that's what I bring to this conversation. And a lot more in a few minutes. <laughs> so um, going straight to it, in, in preparing for this conversation, we thought that it was important to make the clear distinction between facilities management and property management. Oftentimes we use that nomenclature interchangeably, but as we've come to know in the last, should I say, 10, five, 10 years, Clearly, facilities management is no longer just estate management, as we used to call it, or pro properties, as we used to call it. It has become a lot more scientific, and there's a lot more innovation and automation in that area as well. And that's why we're talking. We're talking because we want to create the awareness. We want to tell people that this is what's happening within the space. These are the new things that are going on, and this is how you can leverage on them in what you're doing, so that gradually, across the globe, we begin to have the kind of traction that we're looking for. We want to ask Obert to sort of set the ball rolling for us and help create that distinction clearly in the minds of our listeners, if you like, on the distinction between facilities management and property management. And when you're done with that, take us straight into um, the few thoughts you talked about <laughs> in the area of automation, uh, smart buildings, and using um, technology to leverage some of these thoughts. And then we'll be happy to listen to you. Right. Yes. Thank you, yeah, once again. Um, so um, let me start off by saying, um, in the space of property management, um, you find investors, be it individual, corporate institutions, um, investing large amounts of money to put up buildings. And one of the aims for putting up these buildings, among others, is to get good returns from these buildings. For that purpose, they need specialized skills and people who are well trained to be able to manage these properties for them. And these people normally represent the landlord side of the business. So what they tend to do is they represent the landlord in determining rents, um, letting the space out, selling the property for people to take out spaces in the building. Um, again, on heads of terms, the, core, the key um, terms and conditions for leasing the space. Uh, they vet the tenants who will come into the space and they also work on the tenancy agreements. Now, after all these have been done, they also manage the lease itself because there are terms and conditions, the lease, landlord's responsibility, tenant's responsibilities, and the general conditions and all that. So the property manager also makes sure that they, they get these things going and everything is functioning very well. The closest you find them doing anything that bother on all the tenants in the building, where it's a multi-tenanted building or, yeah, so let's say a multi-tenanted building is where they manage common area. So the common area will be your stairwells, your elevator, your car park, the gardens, all those things they take common area maintenance charge and they maintain that on behalf of the landlord and the tenants. So clearly you can see the property manager doesn't come into the space after it's been let or rented out to the tenants. He's, he's doing for the landlord and making sure the building is well maintained, the investment value of the property continues to grow so that the landlord will be able to realize the objective for which he set out to put up that building. So in a nutshell, that is for the property management. Now, when we come to facilities management, it's a different ball game. After you've taken up the space, there needs to be the continuous managing of that space, running of that space to make sure we are, we are using the space as efficiently as possible. And again, the people who are coming into the space, we need to make sure that provisions are made for them to feel comfortable and feel that the health and safety requirements are all catered for and they can focus on their job without too many breakdowns and complaints and all that. And again, because you've spent a lot of money in a, taking up this space and you're running the space, you also want to be as efficient as possible when it comes to your spend and other things. So you find that in the facilities management space, there are services that are rendered in that space. And generally they attempt hard services, soft services. The hard services I'll say are the um, building services, which are normally your electrical, mechanical um, stuff. So your power, your generators, your elevators and stuff. Those things are an integral part of the building that makes the building function very well. And it is one of the things that a facility manager has to manage and make sure they are working so that people can go in and out of the building and enjoy the building without much complaint. Then there's the soft services, which 
others refer to as tenant services or business services, there are various names that go for it. But those are the ones that directly impact the people who live, who live and work in the building. Okay, so we are talking about cleaning. We are talking about catering. We are talking about front desk, somebody at the reception to be able to use. We are talking about security and all those things. So those are the things that directly impact the people day to day um, run, um, being in the building. And here you find that there are a lot of service companies. So when facilities management started, you, you, you find that some of these organizations have a full team in-house to be able to do all this. But it also has its limitations because then change and other things become difficult because they get so set in their ways and they don't respond to change quite quickly. So then we've got specialist vendors who provide specialist services for organizations. So you get somebody doing air conditioning services, you get somebody doing generators, somebody doing cleaning, fumigation, pest control, catering, and all those things. As they come in and facilities management began to grow, now I also realized that in, facility, in the facility space, gradually there's been a move from people having their own office, compartmentalized offices where somebody has a big office with right. silver to, um, a sofa and a couch and all conference tables into a more communal office space, which we call the open office. Now, um, when the open office concept started, there was a lot of pushback because people were complaining about privacy, privacy. and all those things, <laughs> which is really not true because the proper implementation of open offices, you find that there are private spaces where you can do private stuff. So you can have a phone booth in that open office where you can go and have your confidential calls. You have your meeting rooms, you have collaborative areas and all that. That all forms part of the open office. So people have a very limited understanding of open offices to mean that we are all sitting in the open and you can hear what everybody does, but it needs to be put in the right context. So once you had that, then you also realize that buildings began to become more intelligent mm. with automation and other things coming in. So just to give you three, three key examples, because my colleagues are also coming, um, you find out when you go into some buildings, when you're coming out of the washroom, there's a smiley um, thing out there for you to indicate your satisfaction with the how well the washroom was kept. First, they would have sent you a, um, um, a questionnaire in your email or brought you a form to indicate your satisfaction. But now you just do that in real time, the facilities manager is able to see how well the building is being managed as far as the washrooms are concerned. Mm -hmm. Two, you find in a building, there are so many meeting rooms and everybody wants a meeting room on their floor. And for some, for like a week, nobody is using that meeting room. Exactly. And it is space per square meter, that is cost business. So with advanced automation and sensors and other things. Now facilities managers are able to see how meeting rooms are being used and use them very well. And again, in the energy space, you here in Ghana, people used to come and read, um, take your meter readings and all that. Now we've moved away into smart meters and even automatic meter readers, AMR, where you're able to see at any point in the day where your, you have your peak energy um, use and um, where they are wastage and other things, and you can put in a lot of intervention. So to set the ball rolling, just there's just a few that I want to say to the pension. I noticed that Thank Paul you. kept smiling while, while you were speaking. Maybe just a quick reaction, just in creating this distinction also, Paul. Do you have a few words before we continue? Yeah, and this is where really, you know, we've got to move on from um, schedules. You know, if you look at cleaning, it's always done on a schedule every two hours, every four hours, whatever it might be. Mm. You know, right now, we've just got chaos going on in these buildings. We, nobody knows what's happening. You know, what we see in London, I'm sure it's different to Ghana, what we see in London is that hardly anyone comes to work on a Monday or Friday. Um, so why have you got the same amount of FM staff and why are you doing it every two hours if you've got one third of staff coming on a Monday and Friday? And what we're trying to say is that you digitalize, you get to know what's happening, then you start cleaning when things need to be cleaned, you restock when they need to be restocked. And, you know, some of the stuff is so, you know, that's what we focus on is how do we simplify this? Um, but yeah, I, and again, I do think the, the landlord and the tenant relationship, now that we're focusing on net zero and sustainability goals, I do think those quite fractious relationships have to change and have to start working together. And the landlords and tenants need to start saying, you know what, let's go make an example here of this building, this, this Cal Bank building, and let's work out how together we can lower the, the, the utility usages. Um, and I think it's a time for us to converge and, and, and try and get away from what was always fractious. Oh, you said this in the contract and I said that in the contract. I think it's time for a bit more openness together. Yeah, to move that process towards a need-based need approach. Obed, let's come back to you very briefly. Now, you're going to talk to us about automation, smart buildings. Same thing you started earlier on, but to continue from what Paul just said, how do we leverage on some of these things 
smart metering. You've talked about smart metering. You've talked about building management systems using technology generally. What's happening today and how do we leverage on that for those who are listening, who are looking to make investments in this area? There's a company listening. There's an investor listening who's looking to come in and do some of this work. What are some of the gains that have been made already and how do we sort of um, leverage on them going forward? Okay, so thank you, Yao. So um, I think following off from where Paul um, left off, so I'll start with the cleaning conversation that he brought. So what you tend to find is in our buildings, you find maybe three cleaners per floor, just walking around the floor and cleaning. And for some strange reason, you find out maybe on that particular floor, the whole day, nobody will be working from that floor. And that is cost. So with automation and all those things, you are able to see which part of the building. And let, let's go to space use. So now there are sensors in buildings that are able to tell you which parts of the buildings are highly used and which parts are not highly like they are least used okay mm -hmm. and you gather this data over time so over time you're able to determine how to allocate your resources within the building okay. so where they are highly used you're able to focus get a lot of the cleaners to those places because they need to the turn around as far as cleaning needs to be more where in that space also exactly compared to just deciding in the old traditional way to just spread um, cleaners across the building and all that. And again, even for space use, you are paying per square meter or per square foot. That is real cost to you. There's no point, and, and there's been a lot of study that's been done, um, some by Cornet Global and all, that shows that normally what you tend to find is in the regular day when we're running a, um, um, your office, occupancy is around 45 to 50%. Most people are either in a meeting, gone um, traveled out or doing something else but their workstations are sitting there and you are paying for that space so with automation and all these sensors that have come in they're able to tell you how best you can use your office space and use them very well people are moving away from me space that is my space this is my desk to a we space that is the open plan office where people can now book and come into the office space to do work and when they are out, they clean and somebody else also takes over. So with this automation and stuff, it helps us to be able to allocate our resources very well and still give the people who work in the building that kind of good experience, which is more efficient and effective. If you come to the energy side, if you look at the facilities management, um, facilities managers cost centers, energy, if you take our rent and all the energy is one of the biggest costs that we are faced sure. with. Yeah. And constantly we are challenged to see how best we'll be able to reduce our energy cost. So with all these smart meters that are coming and with the data that is coming out of these smart meters, it helps us to make very good decisions. Mm -hmm. Facilities mind is moved from the space where it was just pay. You bring your bill, you just process, you pay. We are seen as a cost center to a more techn technical area where now people are using data from all these automated sources to be able to make very good decisions and help the very efficient, run lean, and still be able to give people. You know, when you talk about data, I just, I just want you to harp on it just a little bit for me, because the importance of this data we talk about is that it gives you trend analysis. So for yeah. example, hitherto, like you say, we will just push the bill, push the invoice. Yeah. But now you can sit back and say in the last six months, compared <laughs> same time last year, I've spent X yeah. amount on power. When we run our branches or when we run our institutions, there are two lines of power. It's either alternative power or main power. Yeah. Now. When, when your cost is going up on one line, it should be going down on the other. How do you see that without the benefit of automation? That's what the power of this data. You can also look at your expenditure and look at where there's waste and there's leakage. You know, mm -hmm. So it's, it's important to that cost efficiency you know, model that we're talking about. And that's why I want you to hit on that, the, the, the use of technology to power data to make our processes better and more efficient. So, so one of the things that facilities management have been faulted on is how we use data efficiently. Because in our space, there's so much data. There's so much data at times, it's so confusing. Exactly. <laughs> and knowing how to use the apply, understand that data and apply it to be able to be efficient and also help be, um, to be able to do more with less is very important. So um, you, you talked about the energy one. Um, so for instance, you're able to break your data into matrices like performance indicate things that you'll be able to measure with. So let's say, for your energy, you want to break them into um, unit costs per square meter or something. It's very important once you get your data and you have all these metrics in place to start from somewhere. And that is where benchmarking comes in. Normally, if you don't start to measure, you don't measure your, your information with a, at, from a starting point, it becomes very difficult because then you just have the data, you are not measuring anything. Exactly. 
But when you start benchmarking, and that is what I think every facility manager should focus on, starting from somewhere, get the benchmark right, with the right data, get the benchmark right, and start building on that. You can benchmark within the organization using previous year's numbers to be able to see whether I'm going up, whether I'm coming down, whether I'm trending flat. And in all these cases, you can still have opportunities to be able to do better to reduce your cost. Hold that thought for me. I'll come back to you. Um, Kofi, I want to bring you into this conversation and I want you to focus for me on the area of support being relevant and avoiding downtimes. Because I've always said that support is relative when it's available and when it's timely to avoid downtimes. For most institutions, if you are, if you're a facility manager and the management of your facility results in downtimes for the operation, clearly people begin to look at, are we spending all this money for nothing? We should be able to have uptime to work. UPSs are down, systems are shut down. When the systems are shut down, you know, no branch can work, no service is given, that's money lost. How do we leverage on all of this, you know, following from, um, from the points that Obed has shared in avoiding or reducing to the barest minimum, you know, downtimes on our operation in the management of our facilities? Well, so um, Obed made a very good point on data and now facility management, as he rightly said, has moved from that old fashioned sense of caretaking, repairs and maintenance. There's a lot more involved now. And what data adds to that is for it is, is the opportunity to be predictive and also to be preventive. Now that's what helps you cut down on your downtime. So a study done on about 200,000 work orders showed that for every um, 98 corrective maintenance activities, you had just two preventive maintenance activities. Now that's a very stark statistic. Yeah. It tells you that people only fix it when it's broken. Now, if you're looking at an airport, for example, if an escalator breaks down, that's people missing their flights. But that's just being mischievous, Kofi, <laughs> just being mischievous, what you say is true. But don't you think that that mindset comes from, you know, what we always say, that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the finance exactly. people will say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> Except that you can explain exactly. to them that if it finally breaks, it will cost you more yeah. than if you let Fantastic. me fix it today, you know? Fantastic. And that's where data comes in. So all that is based on knowledge. But with data, you get a lot more insight. You get to know that if I am being predictive and preventive, I extend my asset life by that much. And it's going to show that when we are more predictive, we can now cut down on our maintenance costs by between 28 to 33 percent. And if you are also planning ahead and you are using this data, you could be cutting down your work order times by about 8.7%, according to recent research. So let's say you were spending 100 minutes on repairing every broken down asset. Now you are going to reduce that work order time down to about um, 92.3. That means you are saving on money as well, because if you are paying this person by the hour, you are saving 8.7% on that money you are paying. And on the average, you've got facilities recording about um, 10,000 work orders every year. That's good money you are saving. So that's where the business case lies when it comes to using data to drive decision-making in facility management. Right. But specifically speaking to, let's say, the examples of you in Florida or the examples of, of, of yeah. Ghana in facilities like Terminal 3, like you speak about, let's share some specific thoughts on recommendations on what can be done. Let's just pick one or two areas and share some thoughts on that as well. Okay, so um, I'll quickly run through a presentation um, which will give us some background to that. Um, so let's um, do that right now. So um, can you all see my screen? Yes, yeah. yes we can, Kofi. Okay, brilliant. So the building you see on the left of this is one of the um, buildings at this facility we are talking about for some contractual and confidential reasons. I may not be able to give you all the details. We'll call it but building X. Take... Don't worry. <laughs> 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 so I'll take you through um, where we started from, where we've gone, and what people are calling the big idea over there, and what some of the enabling technologies are, and specifically my area of um, expertise, BIM, um, or Building Information Modeling for FM. And I'll give you a brief demo um, and conclude. If we can do all so, of this in, in six minutes, you'll be my best man for today. <laughs> that's not a problem. Right. So there are changing needs, obviously. Um, there is new technology on the table, 
which gives us new possibilities, but then there are challenges. Myself coming from an architecture background, moving from the drawing board to the computer, I face some of these things. And with these challenges, um, gives you the opportunity to improve your capabilities. Now, in the old system or traditionally, this is what facility managers end up with when the contractors and designers are done and the building is handed over to them. So if you need to find the installation manual or the operation manual for equipment X, using your own terminology, you have to go through all these documents um, to find them. And that introduces a lot of rework, a lot of inefficiency. So what's the big idea? It's about information or data enhanced action. And that's what we call data-driven FM here. So this helps us to reduce rework, cut down on downtime, because if an equipment is broken and I need to um, go through all that documentation to find the instructions to fix it. It means downtime is extended. It means I'm losing money from um, the customers that were going to be in the building using the asset or using the facility at that time. And by that, we also help extend the asset and facility lifetime. So a number of technologies come to play here. And we've got building information modeling as the foundational technology. So what this does is um, it helps you put together the, the geometry of your building and the non-geometrical stuff, which is the um, details, the metadata that you need to run these equipment. So for example, you've got your installation manuals, your warranties, which are very important when it comes to facility management. Um, all of that fall under the BIM platform. And then some of the other enabling technologies are reality capture. So before your walls, your drywalls go up to cover your infrastructure, you can scan them and have these converted into images that you can easily refer to when you want to open up um, a wall and fix some piping behind there. The internet of things, as we've all talked about here, is doing immense stuff for all of us. Um, we can collect enormous amounts of in-use data and connecting that to geographic information systems or GIS, we are able to find our way quickly to work order asset, work orders or um, equipment which are broken down. So there's a ping on your mobile device that, hey, that equipment is, is not acting right. And with a tablet, you find your way right to where it is and you can respond to such work orders quickly. So let me get, just give a brief overview of what this involves. Now, building information and modeling involves three things, policies, processes, and technologies. And together, we come up with a methodology that helps us to manage building and project data. Now, facility management, on the other hand, involves similar things, multiple disciplines, people, place, technology. And the goal is to ensure functionality, comfort, and efficiency of buildings as well as safety. But then over the years, there are five problems we've identified. People are uncertain about how things work. People are uncertain about the technology. And also, there's a big gap in the technical know-how. And the value, like you said earlier, has not really been proven because there are lack of examples of how much people are saving and what people are also doing. And underlying all of this, there are trust issues. Contracts play a big role in this. But then I'll go strictly to how, why this has happened. And it's because people have not really understood how this works, how people um, use BIM for facility management. The owner has been taken out in most of the research work done and also practice. And that's what we are now saying that, look, the owner is very important. He is paying all the money. Let's bring him into the loop. But then how do we get the owner to accept this? And that's where we need to um, let them understand what the relative advantage they get. And that's what we call performance expectancy. So is this technology going to meet my needs? Is it going to be useful for me? How much effort do I need to put into it? Um, does someone out there expect me to use it? And that's where governments come in. Um, so that's what, what we call social influence. And with facilitating conditions, we are talking about, are there the right people out there to help me do this? And all that goes to influence my use or the actual use of this. So I'll show you a quick video of the kind of work we've been doing here. And this is a video put together with some of our partners. And the goal here is to collect all the data that we can all the data that we can get from the design phase. So this being a building on site, um, if we needed to find some information on the escalator, we don't need to go through those banker boxes. Everything is um, attached to the piece of equipment in here. And this also helps with space utilization. Um, 
which I know Paul will be talking about very shortly. But here we've got everything we need on that particular asset. We know it's manufactured by this company. We know it's a light transit escalator. If we want the product documentation, we go straight to that link. It opens up and this can be on a mobile device, which um, you can take around when you are doing your work orders. And we'll be showing a very um, short demonstration of how that can um, be used in real life by the people who go out there to fix these problems. Um, here again, we tell you about the cost, the replacement years, and we cannot do forecasting based on that. So when it comes to space utilization, um, who have we assigned the space to? Um, what's, who is the occupant? Um, has it been leased out yet? And there are a lot of things that we could do with this um, kind of data. Um, when we attach real-time technologies like um, IoT sensors, and also when we have um, artificial intelligence helping us to analyze some of these um, data that we get. So this is a basic work order management system or computerized maintenance management system, which we use to send out work orders. And here we can now have access to all of these, visualize these elements in 3D, and then have them on devices. So he goes out, scans the um, barcode or the, um, the QR code, he gets an augmented reality image and he's able to um, report on repairs that they have done or things that they have installed in real time and it goes back into that system. So right. briefly, that's what we have been doing with this particular um, facility. But then the caveat here is don't fall for the shiny tool Technology mm. is only a tool, not a solution. The not people solution. in the processes are the most important. And this yeah. comes from um, one of our graduates here from the school who is now the vice president of construction and strategic innovation. Mm. And they are doing some brilliant things with technology in the residential development space here in the US. So that's um, right. my uh, take on that. <laughs> so much information in there. So minutes. much information there. <laughs> But there's something that stood out very strongly for me, and that's the availability of data. You were talking about putting all of this information in sorry, a certain place so that once, once you go there, sorry, Kofi, um, I was saying that one of the things that stood out for me in your presentation was the availability of data. So that if anyone looks at it later on, availability of data on site with regulatory authorities deposited, so that whoever's looking for it can just go straight in and say, if there's a fire, if the regulators come there and they say, how many floors are in this building? Where is the fire escape? All of that should be available within the built environment. That leads me to my next conversation. And Reggie will be sharing some thoughts with us in the, in the regulatory area, the fire codes, um, the building codes, the building ordinances, the building permits, and all of that. How do we leverage all of this technology to make that process also better? Because today, not only um, with the onset of FATCA and all the regulatories and all of that, things are changing around the world in terms of control also. And people want to know. They're asking a lot more questions. How many people have been in this building in the last one month? Now they want to know. The facility manager cannot just say, oh, um, I'll go and pull up a box and you'll check. You go and check the cameras. Somebody needs to have that information somewhere. Yeah. How do we interface yeah. with the regulators in all of this process? Reggie, yeah. share some thoughts with us in the next few minutes. I've been prompted that my time is running out. So let's go. <laughs> sure, so I'll, I'll be very we'll get Paul, Paul to share some thoughts as well yeah. before we round up. Okay, sure. Yes. So um, I'll touch on three main areas. Mm -hmm. um, first, what are the regulators? You need to know them, mm -hmm. what they do and the impact that you are talking Brilliant. about. Brilliant. So in the facilities management space now, for you to be able to work, you first need your registration documents. So of mm. course, the registrar general comes in play where you fall under a certain category. And that gives you the license to operate in that, in that area. Then the local assemblies also play a vital role, wherever you find yourselves, um, in terms of the building operating permit for the building itself. And then also uh, giving you the... Um, impact assessment reports before the building was put up. And then the habitation permits that you also need to acquire to allow people to live in or use the buildings. Then we also have the EPA who play a very vital role. Now their permit borders on the waste disposal. And uh, this has to do with the refuse. And then also in modern, uh, in modern times, you're looking at uh, the water that emits from your bio wastewater. Uh, wastewater and then also looking at the soil waste, where is it going? How are you treating it? And once it has been treated, is the water coming out, um, uh, meeting the standard to be um, discharged into the drains? So these are the main regulators in, on, in, the, build, in the building industry now. Mm. Then of course, you won't leave out the fire service uh, who, would, who would randomly come and check your mm -hmm. uh, fire permits, whether your panels are working. 
And in modern times, technology has um, installed sensors to ensure that when there is fire, the facilities manager is able to see in real time who is in the building and which sectors are they in because of the sensors. And this has uh, enhanced the evacuation processes and reduced time adequately. So the facility manager is able to know that uh, three people are here, four people are here, and then is able to get their fire wardens there to get them down. Then we also look at the uh, Ghana Standard Authority, who is now checking, uh, verifying the weights and lifts and all those things in the buildings. And that is an area where you realize that in the past, there wasn't much attention and uh, there's a lot of safety issues with the lift, but now they are regulating those areas well, and that is also improving. Um, because of time, I only end on the Ministry of Interior. They are regulating the security. So you realize previously, our security companies were all using different uniforms, different apparatus, but now that regulation has come in. And this is vital because when you come to the building, it, it's like uh, Obed was saying, there's a soft service where the security is supposed to be welcoming and then also polite and able to understand mm. what the building requirements are and in case of emergency, what the procedures uh, should be. Mm. Now, quickly, I'll touch on what are the impacts of these uh, regulations uh, on the, on I'll, the tell you what, I'll let you do the impact on your closing remark. Sure. But let me just quickly bring in Paul. Uh, you have a presentation right. as well for us. Let's see if we can do this in six minutes also. Of course, and, I can do, I can do anything in six minutes. minutes. Yes. I can do anything in six minutes. I actually, uh, I, 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 I'm going to talk a little bit about fire as well, because um, I have to say I slightly disagree today on, on, on the insights in real time on fires, because uh, mm. we've really see, changed things a lot on this side. I'll take you through quickly what we're doing. So look, the one thing I focus on is not making things complicated for the occupants. And that's really the core focus on what we feel is needed. You can have all your sensors, but what you need to know is who is where in a building. And that's the one piece that's really missing. So what we what we've seen here, especially in the in, in the West, you know, the Far East, quite frankly, from New Zealand to China, have done an amazing job with COVID. We've absolutely messed up on the West, and we've seen a massive change in how people use buildings. And we're seeing the mentality of the next generation coming along that don't even want to work five days a week in an office. They don't want to come into the office. And from the stats we have in all the buildings we're monitoring in, say, London, we see massive disruption. We see people on a Monday and Friday think it's a day off. They come in around, we're getting 20, 30 percent of occupancy Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Now, this is not in the business plan of any landlord and they have to now change or they're going to die. And we're seeing we're seeing massive numbers of landlords going into administration. And then we're seeing ones who have a wisdom realizing we've got to move ahead and we've got to we've got to stop this. So the whole idea of um, tracking occupants and the movement is absolutely a total necessity now and in buildings there's about 30 percent of the electricity used in buildings is completely wasted now i work in that building right there in the center behind me and as you can see this is like a forest of christmas trees lit up all night long there is no need for it it is a waste of electricity on a grand scale and some of the situations are so utterly stupid a five-year-old could work out how to save the money but they don't have data to know what to do and therefore they leave the systems on and that's the big issue. I mean, for example, my building here is on, the air conditioner is now on seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and yet is me and maybe two or three hours in on a Saturday. It's crazy. But we're gonna change that by putting, giving the data to know how, how to change things. Now, what we do is we deliver you ways of understanding the behavior of, of, your, of your tenants, identify clearly where you can make your cost savings, how to utilize space better, but also for high rise buildings, it's about how to minimize risk. And right now, as someone said earlier about managing and well, you can't manage what you can't measure. What we do is give you the measurement tools so you can measure. And that's what it's all about, really. Mm. Now, the, you know, there's no point in me being on this conference today if I'm going to tell you this technology is going to cost you a fortune. I'm only on this because actually all we focus on is the return on investment. Why is you know, Cal Bank or Fidelity Bank going to put our system in place? Because we bring five years, we save you. We save you major amounts of money. We bring you the return investments. Your security teams will be digitally detected of every single breach of security that happens. If an asset moves, your television screen moves, or a conference phone is taken, we will know who walked out with that. Step up and look for opportunity. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Paul, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. And then your reception teams, they know who's coming out of a lift, they know who the person is. They can interact with them straight away. And then we build a lot of co-communication technologies. So technologies that allow us to um, 
David, your phone, your David. Sorry, just a little bit of interference, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we built the COVID tech, COVID tech, uh, COVID mitigation technology. So knowing when someone walks the front door, having a temperature, closing down their access control, delivering virtual doors. And for FM, as I mentioned to you earlier on, with FM, we're telling you not to work on a schedule, to work on what you need to do, where and when, and how many people do you need seven days a week, how to make sure it's all correct, and then the, the, the digitalization for high-rise buildings. Now on that, we have a lot of different techniques here. So we have everything from our UHF, which is our our, our our car detection system from 20 meters away to our integrated cameras that give you overall occupancy to work we've done with Hick Vision in China on the temperature controlled solutions. Now, this is something which hasn't really taken off the west side. I thought it would. In the Far East, it's everywhere. This, however, is what I want to get back to you on the fire evacuation of high-rise buildings. This is a real evacuation of Manchester Metropolitan building, building, uh, University. At the moment an alarm goes off, your team in Accra, your fire team in Accra know exactly what they're going to, how many people are there, how many have got a disability issue, how fast is that building evacuating, where do they need to focus on, and as their firefighters go in, they can see where the firefighters are floor by floor in that building. This is giving you an x-ray of a building in real time. And after the disaster of London four years ago with the Grenfell Tower where 72 people died, the reason those people died, forget about cladding, the reason those people died is because the wrong decisions were made by the firefighters when they got there. Simple. They shouldn't have died. Now, the building would have gone on fire anyway, but they made the wrong decisions. And no matter where we go around the world, from Dubai to New York to London, there are you can't see clarity in a, in, in a situation like this. And that's what we're going to change. And the way we do that is by bringing AI in, by bringing all of these systems together to know how long should the building take to evacuate at 10 o'clock in the morning with 2,000 people compared to 10 o'clock at night with, with 20. And that's what will change. And how we do all this technology is really simple. We only put our sensors in, in your lift lobbies. We embed inside your access card our secondary technology, and this is detected by our sensors. It delivers you the data, and we deliver you communication protocols so your FM person, your building manager, your landlord, your receptionist has the data, has the detections, has that information that they need to make the right decision there and then. Wonderful. We have things like live view, we have direct view, we have reporting and occupancy reporting there as well. And all of this data to show you what is happening, how many hours, what, how busy each part of your day is. And you then make your decisions going forward. What's happening with each employee, what's happening with each company in the buildings, across your entire portfolio, you can see what's happening. And it allows you to compare and contrast each building to know where you should go next. You know, we, got, we got clients like Deloitte, so all of Deloitte's staff in the UK, all 25,000, have a triple technology card that allows us to build what we call virtual doors, where there's no longer doors with security there because we allow them to walk in and out freely and therefore not touch against door handles, which is going to spread COVID. And this is, you know, we've built this across the world. We're in Saudi Arabia, we're in the USA. I've got an office in, in China. And again, I see Africa, the next 10 years, Africa is going to be the one golden opportunity in the world. It's where growth is going to happen, be, uh, far beyond anywhere else. I have no doubt about that. Hence, this is why I'm here today. I'm really so much. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Paul. I mean, I think that's that's great. And I'm very sure that a lot of people listening who are going to make contact with you after, after we finish from here uh, with Cyril and the team are great thoughts. While you just end it right now, your take That's out from, done, yeah. from the conversation today, 30 seconds. What should we remember from Paul Sheedy today if we remember nothing? 30 seconds. <laughs> I dread to hear this answer. <laughs> <laughs> your take out from today, Paul. Your take out, 30 seconds. Yeah, I just think we're all on the right track. You know, I've, I've, I spent some time at COVID over the weekend. And it's all about us all working together. It's taking what we need to know. It's giving you clarity and moving forward. That's what we all need. And if we have clarity, if we can measure what we need to know, we can manage what we need to know. Measure what we need to know, we can manage what we need to know. Kofi, your take out from today, if you could just touch a bit on COVID for me, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think COVID has taught us that we don't need to rely on past knowledge alone. We need to be driven by active real-time data. Um, that's very important. And um, collaboration is also key. We can't um, have all these automated solutions sitting in islands and what we call islands of automation. We need to bridge everything together. And I'm really excited with what Paul is doing. Um, 
It'll be interesting to see how the three dimensional views and all of that are layered onto that. So um, fire rescues could actually plan their um, evacuation routes in real time based on where people are stuck in the building. So it's it's quite interesting where things are going. But one of the key things um, that I would say is let people own these processes and the implementation. Otherwise, we are going to be stuck in a capability trap where, yes, these tools are capable, but we never get offline. Let's get people involved. Let them own the processes. Let people own these technologies. That's what I'd say. While we digitize, don't put the people thing out. Let people be a part of that process. That's Kofia Savri. Reggie, your final thoughts, 30 seconds. Sure. So what I would, uh, my take home is um, basically saying that um, this new technology that is coming is going to help us to move away from the repairs and maintenance that we know to more uh, insightful predictive maintenance, which will save cost. To where Paul, Paul, was Paul, Paul wants us to go, <laughs> which will save cost for the owners of the building because mm. cost is now a very big issue, especially in the country, looking at all the taxes and the things that are coming up. So this technology can help us leverage on that to save cost and then also ensure that the building's values are maintained over time for the various owners. Yeah. Brilliant. So there is hope for the future. Definitely. Definitely. Obed, your, your closing comments. All right. So um, what I'll say is um, if you look at the facility space, um, if you take any organization, some of the, the three big cost centers you find is the human resource technology and facilities. And this is an area where organizations need to pay a lot of attention. Just the same way that I cannot go to the hospital and get a quack doctor to take care of you. It's the same way that you need somebody who is well-trained and a specialist to handle this, because this is big money we are talking about. This is all your asset that you've entrusted in the care of somebody. And the person needs to be well-trained, understand all these technologies, how to apply them, how to apply data, how to make insights, use the matrices to be able to build and save costs and still get the people in the building very happy, health and safety and all those things observed. So I think it's important that we get people trained to be able to do this job and do them well so that they can use the technology that's coming. And, 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 and here we have good organizations like the IFMAS and the GHIS and others um, all around who can give their members all the training that they need. Brilliant. There's a lot of information available. I wish we could continue, but like all good things, this has to come to an end also. Just want to say a big thank you to my, my panel here today. Reggie, um, you are head of properties at Goal Key Properties. Thank you for joining us. Obed, you are Head of Properties and Facilities Management at Fidelity Bank. It's been brilliant having you. I wish we could spend some more time talking. Kofi, you stayed up uh, all night. Uh, you PhD <laughs> student, College of Design, Construction, University of Florida. Thank you. And Paul, I know you were traveling up until this morning, but you took the time to join us. Paul is from Unify ID UK and China. We also want to say thank you to some of our sponsors, the Embassy of Denmark, IFC Edge Program, CalBank, um, Ernst Young, Grand Force and Access Bank. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. I believe that most of the material will still be available online even after we continue with this conversation. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we continue with a free workshop on introduction on IFCH. Thank you all for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.